I'm Pascal Chariot, I'm the CEO of Enerdata, and I would like to welcome you on this uh, webinar and just make a short introduction. Um, so we will introduce you some case study we have been developing with a, a tool and new process we developed during the last months, which is called Enertram, standing for Energy Transition Monitoring. Um, I will give the word to Patrick Kriki. Patrick is a, um, is a senior consulting advisor to Enerdata, but more than this has been for many years a senior, a senior expert of energy policies and energy transition, both in France, but all in Europe and, and in many other countries. So thank you, Patrick, for being with us today and for presenting these case studies. Uh, technically speaking, we will have a presentation that will last some 30, 40 minutes, and then there will be room for questions and answers. You might, you might ask questions uh, through the chat box that you have on your screen. We will either answer to some of the questions during the presentation or uh, during some breaks uh, uh, or just at the end of the, of the presentation. So thank you again for being here today. Uh, sorry for this small technical issue at the, at the launch, but now we we begin the presentation. Thank you. Well, thank you. Well, very thank much. you very much, Pascal. Pascal. Uh, uh, and uh, and uh, I, I will indeed present this, this new, new uh, uh, data, data information, information system. system uh, 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 which uh, Brings, uh, brings uh, which intends to uh, bring uh, insights on the, uh, the future, future development, development of energy transitions. Energy transitions. I'm sorry, I'm we sorry, have a lot, lot of echo, and it's okay. Okay, that's better. That's okay. better. Okay. Uh, in a tram, in a tram it tends to, to, put to put together three types, three types of information, of information, different information. Informations. Information, information of, of on existing, existing trends, trends in the energy, energy systems, systems. Uh, uh, information, information on the policies, on the policies that, that are currently that are implemented, implemented be implemented in the, in the context, context of the Paris, of the Agreement. Paris Agreement and information, and information on, on what should be, what should be the trajectories towards, towards degree degree compatible, compatible scenarios. scenarios. Uh, uh, for, this, for this, we have we developed, have developed a, a tool that combines energy databases from, uh, from inner data scenarios as produced by uh, an energy modeling system based on, on the Boltz model and uh, a system of information on the, on the national policies. In this uh, webinar, I will uh, first introduce the, the key issues dealing with the uh, implementation of energy transition in the different countries and particularly issues raised by the differences between ongoing observed trends, the national contributions as defined by the Paris Agreement and two degree trajectories. In a second stage, I will uh, present what currently exists in some countries in some of national energy transition dashboards. What are the indicators that are identified by, by uh, series of countries which try to describe the process of energy transition and to monitor this transition in order to develop uh, effective policies. The third stage will be the presentation of the methodology used in the energy transition monitoring uh, Enertram system and the work in progress. And in the second part of the webinar, I will present uh, three case studies that have been recently developed uh, for the Agence Française de, de Développement. Uh, one case study on Vietnam, one on Mexico, and one on Senegal. I will not present a fran French case because well, we have quite a lot of material on this issue, but uh, it would be too, too long. But I may, I may be able to answer some questions 
on the, on the French case. So I hope this will give an idea of how uh, appropriate information system can help to to observe and to participate in the, in the definition of uh, effective energy and climate policies. So starting with observed trends, national contributions, and two, com two degree compatible trajectories, the first slide illustrates the fact that probably the Paris Agreement is a good agreement, but it is not enough. It is not enough in the sense that when have a careful accounting for the national determined contributions that has been proposed by the different countries in, in Paris in 2015. Uh, this careful account uh, shows, this is a red arrow in this uh, diagram, that when taking into account all the uncertainties on conditional or unconditional commitments or uh, contributions on the uncertainties on, on future economic growth for those countries that define their contributions in relative terms. When taking into account all these uncertainties, one sees that the range of the aggregated national determined contributions is higher than the range of the two degree compatible scenarios uh, identified in IPCC. This means that there should be in the future, future uh, uh, new negotia negotiations and new commitments, and probably with more stringent uh, commitments of the different countries. The, the following slide illustrates the same type of issue, but at, at the country level. We took the China case from uh, climate transparency. Uh, when we see the difference, the two angles, the two gaps, between first the trends and the nationally determined contribution of China, second the gap between the national de nationally determined contribution of uh, China and the two degree compatible uh, scenario for China that would imply uh, a reduction of total emissions uh, by 2020 or shortly after 2020. So we have this double gap between trends and commitments, and commitments and two degree compatible trajectories. Another way to have a look at this issue is taking a, a diagram that uh, I developed in the framework of the DDPP, that is Deep Decarbonization Pathway Project in 2013-2015, before the COP21 negotiations. This project aimed at identifying <coughs> The, the scenarios, the deep decarbonization scenarios for 16 countries among the largest em emitters in, in the world. This is dealing only with the CO2 emissions of the energy sector. And uh, the, it, the illustration is uh, plotting the per capita CO2 emissions of the energy sector of each country against the uh, per capita GDP of these different countries. One can see the huge differences in these two values today with, uh, with uh, the United States uh, with uh, almost 18 or 16 tons of CO2 per capita today versus Vietnam or China with only 1.6 uh, tons of CO2 per capita. So the range is huge, it's a factor of 10 between the highest emitters and even not the lowest emitters because some countries of the world have it's still less than India and China. The, the, the target for two degree compatible scenarios has been defined in this project as reaching about 1.7 tons of CO2 per capita after, uh, shortly after 2050. And this is a powerful, what I would call a focal point for climate policies, because in any case, we will not succeed having two degree compatible scenarios if almost all the countries are not in this range of 1.52 tons of CO2 per capita. 
So this illustrates the, the, the trajectory that the United States have to, uh, to, to, to perform in the, in the future years. Uh, same thing for France. It also illustrates the fact that probably for emerging country, there might be a phase of still increasing uh, ton, uh, em emissions, per capita emissions, followed by some kind of plateau and then decline uh, of the emissions. As, as South Africa put it at some point in the, in the negotiation, uh, this is a concept, the concept of peak, plateau and decline. And this will probably be the, be the case for those countries with low emissions today. And last slide for this introduction. How can we identify the pillars of deep decarbonization? This has been done very clearly by Jim Williams uh, from San Francisco in bef just before the, the deep decarbonization pathway project, but he participated in this project. And this says the following. The first and key policy to be implemented in the deep decarbonization process is energy efficiency. This is a, a major, major issue, how to manage efficiency, uh, uh, what we call in France sobriety, that is uh, re reducing the needs for energy. Energy efficiency is reducing the uh, energy required for one energy service. This is the first stage of the process. Second stage is generation decarbonization, that is uh, how to reduce the carbon content of electricity in every country. But this goes even further. It, it might also mean how to reduce the, the share of fossil natural gas in the natural gas system. Recently in France, a, a study has been performed to study the hypothesis of a 100% uh, biogas in the, in the natural gas system. So this is a, an issue that is rising, a very important one. So the, 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 the second stage is decarbonization of the energy carriers. Electricity is a key element of that, and gas may also be a very important component of that. And the first stage is electrification, that is replacing the carbon intensive, uh, replacing the carbon intensive electricity or, uh, or, or, or gas by low carbon content electricity and, and gas. So this is a diffusing, increasing the share of low carbon energy carriers in the, in the system. So this was a common knowledge in the DDPP project and, and we can find these components in every uh, scenario, whatever the model, whatever the country, these are key components of the deep, deep decarbonization process. A very short view at some energy transition dashboards as they exist in different countries. Uh, in France, there is a set of monitoring indicators in the so-called national low carbon strategy. I will not elaborate on each of the indicators, but uh, just mention the fact that, uh, that there are indicators, of course, for the transport sector, the building sector, agriculture, industry, energy, uh, waste management, and then there are objectives and, and, and the measures and tools to be implemented to reach the objectives. Similar approach in Germany uh, with the uh, a series of indicators I, as identified by the so-called Experten Commission to Monitoring Energie der Zukunft, that is Expert Commission for the Monitoring of uh, the Energy of, for the Future. Pro, uh, project with uh, indicators for energy supply, energy efficiency, renewables, plants, grids, buildings, transport, greenhouse gas emissions, energy prices and costs, macroeconomic effects. Still similar approach by the UK Climate Change Committee that is also in charge of monitoring the transition in, in UK with uh, building, electricity, agriculture, transport, industry, and waste. So you see there is some kind of uh, homogeneity 
in the type of indicators and in the type of process implemented in the monitoring. And finally, I will present a, a dashboard that uh, we find quite interesting because it is very synthetic with 15, 15 indicators. This has been produced by Climate Transparency. We are in contact and collaborate with uh, Climate Transparency. And this illustrates the way that uh, uh, a very compact dashboard can provide quite a, a lot of significant information on the energy transition process. NRTRAM, so this is the information system uh, currently developed by NRDATA. What is the work? This is work in progress in it. What, what are the different components of it? The goal of NRTRAM is to develop uh, this information system on dashboards on indeed ongoing trends, sectoral targets, and transformation trajectories. These are the three dimensions of NRTRAM. The concept is very consistent with the process of international negotiation and more precisely with the nationally determined contributions, as I indicated both. And this process will be highly strategic in the future with the entry into the, into the phase of climate policy implementation in, in most countries of the world. And indeed, this, uh, the, the methodology combines international database and the NF, NF future scenarios that are now from many years developed by NRDATA. The structure of information is uh, some kind of uh, pyramidal organization with on the top indicators that allow to have an overview of the situation and a compact dashboard with a limited number of about 20. 20 or more indicators. At the second level, we develop what we call sectoral KIA indicators for each sector. You probably all know the KIA equation that identify the drivers for energy emission with two, three components. The component of uh, an activity indicator, the energy content of the activity, and then the uh, carbon content of the energy used in the process. So this allows to identify the three key drivers of emissions in the different sectors. At the third and fourth level, we have sectoral strategic variables. Most of them are of a more technical economic nature. For instance, in transport, we will have the number of vehicles passengers kilometer each year, average, con average uh, energy consumption of the vehicle fleet, uh, energy consumption of the new vehicle put in the market, and so on and so on. Most of these indicators are common to any country, but some of them might be country specific because uh, when studying energy transition in the different countries, one can see that some variables or some sectors or some indicators that are strategic for one country are not strategic for another country and, and conversely. So we have to keep room for, from, for country specific indicators that are important in the different countries. And finally, finally the five level at the bottom of the pyramid are the, the whole set of energy data databases on energy supply, demand, prices, investments, uh, capacities in the power sectors, and so on, and so on. Uh, this is an idea of what could be the different uh, indicators in the compact dashboard. We have no about 22 indicators with headlines of or overview indicators on the top, and then indicators for each sector, the power sector, transport, industry, building, agriculture, and land use and land use and, and forestry, land use change and forestry. And finally, for the methodology, mm -hmm. slide for a brief presentation of the pulse modeling system and the NF future scenario. As the pulse modeling system is a full world energy model, a simulation model, is a recursive simulation process from now to 2050. And in the NF future studies, NR data develops from, from now 
three types of scenarios. The Enabron scenarios, which is a fossil intensive scenario. This is not exactly a business as usual scenario. This is more fossil intensive scenarios. Enablue is an NDC compatible scenario. That is a scenario that reflects the current commitments of the different countries in, in the climate negotiation process. And then a green is a different one, more ambitious, which, which reflects what could be two degree C compatible trajectories for, for each country. So we have this set of scenarios. For the moment, we use in NRTRAM the NR blue and NR green, but uh, there might be in the future the definition of other scenarios according to the users of uh, NRTRAM. And we come now to the second part of the presentation with a case study on, on Vietnam. Uh, when we will, where we will compare the NDC scenario, that is the NR blue scenario, and, and the two degree scenario, and illustrate how NRTRAM can give uh, a vision, a precise vision of what is going on, what should be going on in the future in the different cases. So it starts with another view of the situation of Vietnam. You know that Vietnam is a rapidly growing emerging country at more than 6% per year in the past 15 years. It is a, a, a country with a, an urbanization rate of about 34%, still low, but 98% electrification rate. It means that indeed electricity, electrification is, is well developed in Vietnam, and this may explain a very high level of per capita consumption of electricity in Vietnam compared to other South and uh, Southeastern Asia, Asian countries. And particularly what is striking in the case of Vietnam is the fact that uh, electricity consumption growth rate has been of about 12%, that is double of the uh, economic growth in the 15 uh, Past years. Per capita emissions in Vietnam amount to 2.2 tons of CO2. This means it's about one, one third of world average, which is about six tons of CO2 per capita. What are the dynamics of CO2 and GHG emissions? CO2 represents only 51% of total emissions, while CH4 from agriculture particularly, and probably particularly from rice, rice uh, produce, production, represent more than one-third of, of total emissions. So this is a particular feature of the, situ of the situation in Vietnam. The NR blue and NR green scenarios are well fit to the Vietnam lower and upper ambition indices uh, that, that are the conditional and unconditional uh, Determine contributions for 2030. But what is striking is the fact that uh, these uh, scenarios result in extremely contrasted emission futures in 2050. When you continue, when one continues the trends from 2030 on to 2050, then the difference grows uh, tremendously. If you look at the at the diagram on the upper uh, right part of the, of the figures, you can see that in the inner in blue. Uh, and I'm sorry, it's it's better to take better to take the lower lower uh, right diagram. You can see that from the current two tons of CO2 per capita, inner blue results in five tons of CO2 per capita from the energy sector and, and industrial process in 2050, while the energy green scenario uh, results in uh, less than two tons of CO2, which is, by the way, in line with the mm, above mentioned focal point of the DDPP study. This is interesting to note that independently that is, uh, this has not been a constraint imposed in the NR green scenario, but the result of the NR green scenario is consistent with the focal point identified in the deep decarbonization pathway project. The NR future scenario 
provide a reasonable de detail on all the aspects of the uh, energy system in the two contexts, Ener Blue and Ener Green. You can see in this slide the differences between the uh, primary energy uh, supply in Ener Blue on the left and the primary energy supply in Ener Green. One, one can see that from the current 75 million tons of oil equivalent in 2015, we have a tripling of uh, this value in 2050 for the Ener Blue scenario, with coal representing about half of, of total. This means that this scenario is highly coal intensive. In Ener Green, on the contrary, the total primary energy supply is only multiplied by a factor of two in 2050, with an increased contribution of biomass and twice less coal in absolute terms than in energy. Uh, the carbon content of energy has been increasing since 1990 in Vietnam, while the energy content of GDP remains content. Uh, in Ener Blue, the carbon content decreases, and it decreases still more in energy. Uh, we have important energy efficiency improvements uh, in Ener Blue, but, but uh, still more important efficiency in the in green system, which results in this much lower total primary energy supply in Ener green than in Ener. As far as the final energy sectors are concerned, in Ener blue, consumption is in industry is expected to grow much faster than the other sector, with almost a doubling of current consumption of industry by 2050. In Ener Green, an important difference is the fact that indeed energy consumption of industry is uh, limited by efficiency improvements and it represents only 50% of final energy consumption in 2050, uh, with building and transport representing each about 20%. So a different structure of final energy demand with uh, more energy efficiency in energy industry in industry, I'm sorry, uh, in energy. And finally, the power sector, which is uh, very important in the future of the, uh, the Vietnamese energy systems. One can note that compared to official forecasts, uh, we have in Ener Blue and Ener Green a much lower energy consumption as the latest Vietnam national uh, energy outlook prepared uh, by the by the ministry uh, forecasts 1200 terawatt hours in 2050 which is really a quite high uh, forecast or projection as in enadata with a relatively lower economic growth and a lower elasticity of uh, electricity consumption, the result is respectively of 700 and 500 terawatt hours, respectively, in Ener Blue and Ener Green. In Ener Green, the CO2 emissions of the power sector are almost stabilized after 2020, while they continue to grow very sharply in Ener Blue at about 5% per year. And this is due to the fact that there is an increased use of coal, very significant use of coal, as can be seen in the left-hand diagram in the Ener Blue electricity sector projection. Uh, as elements of conclusion on this situation, uh, of the energy situation of Vietnam, as it has been highlighted by Ener Tram, uh, one can identify some kind of dilemma for the future of the energy sector in Vietnam with two very contrasted strategies. A coal-based strategy uh, that may have significant impact for the country with uh, the development of coal power plants that if they are decided today, they will come online by about 2025 and they will be only a two-thirds of their technical lifetime in 2050. So this means heavily relying on coal for the future, and it may induce significant capacity in, in infrastructure investments with a high risk 
of having stranded assets if coal production were to be abandoned due to climate constraints uh, uh, accepted by, by Vietnam. As opposed to this strategy, one can identify a, a more flexible renewable plus gas strategy that would rely much more on renewables and natural go gas in order to, to fit to the growth in energy demand. And that would allow a phasing of diversified low carbon options within the short term, the fact that gas involves twice less emissions per kilowatt hour produced, uh, that is for about 400 against 800 grams of CO2 per kilowatt hour. This is, a, of course, a very general statement, not specific to, to Vietnam. In the medium term, one can consider that gas turbines may be a very well-fitted, if not perfect, but a well-fitted backup to variable renewables when they will develop strongly. Variable renewables are, in particular, uh, wind and, and solar electricity. And in the long term, as I already mentioned, gas from renewable sources, uh, bio, bio, gas, gas from bio sources, may represent an increasing share of, of supply. So one can identify a flexible and, and dynam dynamic perspective uh, for this type of strategy. So from these different types of considerations, from NRTRAM, from more, more uh, focused outlooks on the Vietnamese uh, electricity sector, one can identify maybe three priorities uh, for a country like Vietnam. First, identify the right balance between supply and demand actions. One may consider that the current energy efficiency outlooks for Vietnam are relatively conservative, and maybe there might be more effort put in, in, this di in that direction. Second, one may consider that if Vietnam, uh, unless, uh, I'm sorry, and unless Vietnam considers that it can ignore emission, emission constraints in the long term, unless that case, then Vietnam should avoid carbon intensive supply options that may respond to short term needs, but induce over investment in dirty assets, and as I said, stranded assets in the medium term. And finally, on the contrary, the country could prioritize flexible options, allowing to future adjustments of the strategy and contributing to the design and deployment of an energy system that is both clean and efficient. Second, <coughs> sorry. <coughs> Second case study on Mexico, again comparing the NR blue and the NR green scenario. Uh, from 2000 to 2015, Mexico's population increased by 1.4 per year and, and GDP by 2% per year. That is a much slower uh, population and, and economic growth. And energy consumption has been stable and CO2 emissions even decreased by 0.2% per year during those years. So it means that the starting point is very different in Mexico than in, uh, in Vietnam. This is a relatively grow, low growth compared to other emerging countries, uh, while with four tons of ton, with four tons of CO2 per capita, emissions in Mexico are below the world average, relatively stable since uh, 2000. The inner blue scenario for Mexico extends this situation and is compatible with Mexico's NDC, so that is a flat per capita uh, CO2 emissions while inner green uh, displays a significantly different profile with a reduction of per capita emissions down to 1.5. Again, we find that inner green, and it's an interesting point, uh, inner green satisfies the, the focal point I mentioned earlier, stemming from the different study, the deep DDPP study. Total primary energy supply in inner blue, it is bound to almost double in 2050 from current 180 million tons of oil equivalent. While in inner green, total primary supply is about 25% lower at 
225 million tons of, of, of oil equivalent. The fuel mix is also very different in Enagreen, with more than 50% of supply provided biomass, solar and wind, and, and some, some nuclear. So there is much less... Coal is not very important in Mexico, but natural gas is very important. And this makes also a difference with, uh, with Vietnam. And the use of natural gas is about half uh, in in a green that it is in a blue. So this is a significant difference. Final energy consumption, it is about to increase in both scenarios, uh, also less rapidly in a green. And uh, from in a blue to in a green, in industry is almost unchanged. Uh, because already quite a lot of energy efficiency in industry is taken into account in the energy scenario from uh, complementary studies that has been performed uh, at Benabata on Mexico. Uh, but further, there are further efficiency improvements observed in the buildings and in the transport sector in energy. As far as the electricity sector is concerned, one will uh, check or verify the uh, statement that was provided before. The fact that the, the role of natural gas is uh, very important in, in air blue, while it is much reduced in, in air green. The, the total production is uh, comparable in the two scenarios, about 800 uh, terawatt hours in both cases. Uh, this means that the electrification of the final energy use is an important element in energy. There is more electricity consumption, but uh, uh, there is a comparable electricity consumption, but this is due to the fact that there is an, an electrification of needs and uh, uh, with a lower carbon content electricity in that case. Lower carbon contents, particularly because the consumption of natural gas is approximately stabilized in the energy green scenario. And the, the, those sources that gain market shares in, in the electricity mix are renewables and, and nuclear. What are the insights from Mexico? Uh, the comparison of Ener Blue and Ener Green uh, shows that uh, Mexico is an emerging country with a relatively moderate expected economic growth. But it shows that the current indices are not compatible with deep decarbonization. And uh, the, these are not two degree compatible. And uh, only energy green type scenarios would be indeed compatible in the long term. In the transition, critical will be the cap capacity to limit energy demand growth through enhanced efficiency in buildings and industry and through the electrification of transports. Critical are also the choices in the development of the electricity sector. Uh, while no scenario incorporates a strong hypothesis for coal, the relative weight of renewable and gas will be decisive. Uh, this is a, a difference with uh, the situation we have seen in Vietnam uh, for reasons that, that seems quite clear in the two sectors, the fact that uh, electricity consumption growth is much higher in Vietnam and the use of natural gas is, is a transition option in, in the energy transition of Vietnam, while, the, while in the case of Mexico, the key issue is the development of renewables in the, the process. In a uh, third case study, the energy transition in Senegal, in that case it is a uh, a case in which we do not have uh, long-term energy scenarios for Vietnam, for Senegal, because the country is not identified, is not isolated in the Coles model, and for the moment we do not have national forecasts for, for Senegal. But so we have only to, to consider the ongoing trend. But we can see that even that is quite interesting. Uh, the, the use of a tram, even if the, in the absence for the moment of uh, long-term trajectories, still brings relevant information for energy policy. 
what we can see for the moment is that uh, CO2 emissions in Senegal have risen significantly since, since the early 90s. However, they remain very low in absolute terms. They are today of only 2 million tons of CO2 for, for the country. Uh, we also see that uh, uh, the Senegal's nationally determined contributions imply much higher emissions in the future, uh, about, uh, about um, 20, 25, up to 35 million tons of CO2. And we can also see that per capita emissions, although they have increased very much since the mid 90s from 0 0.3 to 0 0.6 they are still very low you can see that this is uh, only one tenth of average per capita emissions at world level so this puts uh, this uh, a particular light on the situation uh, for countries like senegal Total primary energy supply has doubled between 1995 and 2015. The structure of supply has remained quite stable, with 50% of total energy being provided by oil and the rest by biomass energy. Small quantities of coal are however consumed in, in recent years. The sectoral split of final energy consumption is also relatively stable with buildings, transport and the industry incurring for now quite similar growth as illustrated by the diagram on the, on the right part. Finally, the electricity sector. <laughs> electricity consumption has incurred a much higher growth than other energies as production has been multiplied by a factor of four in the last 20 years compared to a doubling of uh, overall total primary energy supply. This corresponds to a rab rapid, also it is not fully achieved, electrification of the country. Today, 55% of population in Senegal uh, has electricity, but this uh, electrification rates uh, is much lower in some countryside part of the country, down to about 20% in the rural part uh, of the country. Oil provides most of total power production today. However, since 20, 2000, hydro and gas-based production provide one-fourth of total. The sectoral consumption by source is very different from one sector to another. In the building sector, the most noticeable fact is the fact that there is a, uh, all, almost all energy is produced from biomass, mostly traditional biomass. Also, there is a, a strong increase of electricity consumption in recent years. In transport, of course, oil fully dominates, and uh, one can raise the question of the, the possibility of developing uh, electrical vehicle in a country like Vietnam. This uh, raises a set of questions, very, uh, very particular, but probably in the future this question will arise. In industry, one can note a massive progression of coal, while electricity and biomass also progress. What are the insights for Senegal? Uh, Senegal is an emerging country with relatively moderate economic growth, 4%. This is not fully a rapidly emerging country as Vietnam. However, energy demand is expected to grow rapidly in the near future due to the takeoff for energy consumption in transport and industry, and also due to the replacement of traditional biomass by more modern energy carriers in households consumption. Electricity will be a key factor for energy transition as its share will grow in energy for buildings, while the electrification of transport indeed raises particular challenges in a, in a low-income country. Coal, both as a final carrier in industry and as a primary source for electricity, uh, will be a major issue, with again, as in the case of Vietnam, risks of locking in carbon-intensive capacities and infrastructures. Renewable and gas should be considered in this context as complementary alternative to coal in the power sector. 
And this is the end of this uh, presentation with some, I would say, qualitative conclusions on the use and interest of Enercan. Uh, it seems to us that energy transition monitoring will be key in enhancing the ability of governments to develop effective and uh, efficient climate and energy policies. We can see from the first example presented here that the diversity in national circumstances and priorities, so as the diversity in data and modeling, doesn't prevent to develop common tools and to analyze energy transition within a common framework and common insights. I think this is a, an important aspect of the Enertran tool. Uh, we can use a concept of uh, common but differentiated tools for energy transition monitoring as a common but differentiated responsibilities of the different countries in the climate problem. We are here a common but differentiated tool and conclusion. Uh, hopefully this is what comes out of these different case studies that I presented now and I can just mention that for the moment we are strongly involved in, in, in the development of this tool and we hope that the work will go on and meet uh, the, the, the views by, by different users in the future. So, it's Pascal Chario speaking again. So among the questions, there are some technical questions whether the presentation will be available. available. The answer is yes, yes. definitely. So we'll send it to you after the webinar through a PDF format to all the people attending the webinar. You're welcome to any additional questions anyway after, after the meeting. Among the questions that we can answer quickly too, a couple of those, um, one is whether there are comparable studies or information system, system existing? So the answer is yes, yes. yes. But, but that's why we have developed why something. We, we, we went through what is existing on the, on the web, the web, different international organizations, think tanks. What we found was not what we were looking for in terms of analysis, analysis uh, details, and uh, number of countries. So there is, a, you can probably see the slide, Patrick has put on his computer. There are many things, but either it's focused on a too narrow approach, uh, which is, might be the superficial to understand the detail of your investments or policies in a given country, or it does not cover enough countries, or it is sometimes made with, um, with all data. So one of our strengths is basically that we gather very quickly data and update the services. And um, somehow what we built together was uh, enabling to get much more fresh. Anyway, we are going to with some of those uh, in order to to develop a common tool if possible. We don't want to be a on our side. Um, uh, what is available, what is available to the in our analysis, our analysis, analysis the, tool. the tool is the tool not only gathering the data, data but data also putting the analysis data together. Data so data the, data these were the, data the data proof of concept data countries data that we data need, data and we were data looking data for different data kind data of countries, data including data Senegal, data which was a way to look at a country where very few data is available to see what we can understand of this. And now we will deploy, develop, depending on the inputs we have and the needs we, we face, we will not make 100 countries in the coming days, but progressively we want to, to deploy this. Um, Coralie is asking uh, how the two tier three scenarios are defined for each country. So you notice the inner blue, blue scenario, which is on the two degree, is based on the NDC. Anyway, there is some interpretation of the NDC because it's not always very detailed. So, but but it's available, so we can be very specific about what it put into account. And for the two degrees of scenario, the, the model takes into account the price signal, the carbon price constraint, in order to to the well, to increase the impact of carbon emission, so it gives an additional cost to a bigger cost to coal, but also to 
to gas uh, and so on. And, and then it helps uh, the energy efficiency measures or the renewables uh, investment to, be, to become more profitable. So the scenarios are designed at the global level and then are detailed at the country level, uh, country per country, with a good balance of the constraints. It is not one single price, obviously, for all the countries. Then we, well, uh, we welcome additional questions to explain how do we do it, but it, it would take hours and hours to explain. But, but basically, it is a two-degree scenario. There are other ones, uh, but it is uh, one that enables to reach this. Where it's another of the questions, there is still some coal, uh, even if we can consider that coal is not green, but coal is a source of energy today, providing 80% or 75% of electricity in, in, uh, in China, for instance. So in the energy scenario, we divide it coal by two, I think by the uh, 2040, so which is huge. Of course, we could have other scenarios going to zero coal in 2040, and could, that could enable probably a, a visualization of uh, lower than two degree uh, temperature increase. But the question is then if it's uh, realistic and so on. Maybe Patrick, I can give you the final word and a, a couple of other questions and, and the conclusions if you want. Okay. So thank you. Uh, so one question is uh, no, one question is on uh, the three pillars of decarbonization: energy efficiency, decarbonization of energy carriers, and transfers to low carbon carriers at final level. Uh, this is a very difficult uh, question in the sense that this depends. This depends very much on the condition of the different countries. But basically, one can consider that, uh, that uh, uh, there, there are indeed some trade-offs, at least between the, the two options. That I mean that, uh, uh, for instance, in the case of France, current policy is uh, as a very strong demand policy, as the target is uh, reducing energy demand by a factor of two, that is by 50% in 2050 which allows to have a, a, a low level energy supply. So this is mostly putting the emphasis on the first pillar of the transformation. But also one can consider that uh, this policy uh, uh, will not be easy to be implemented and there might be different trade-off in the future. That is, if we do not succeed in reducing uh, total energy demand by a factor of two, then it might be necessary to have a further decarbonization uh, either of electricity, but in France for the moment, electricity is quite low carbon already, but also decarbonization of other energy carriers, whether natural gas or, or gaseous, gaseous uh, fuels or liquid fuels and so on. So the, 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 the relative weight of the three pillars differ very much of the initial context and of the policies followed in the different uh, in the different countries. Another question is why not consider dispatchable renewables and storage for uh, balancing variable renewables rather than gas? That's uh, also a very good question. I think this is uh, typically the type of uh, uh, perspective that the different countries have no to, to define. The, the problem of um, dispatchable renewables uh, such as hydro uh, in many countries, not in all countries, but in many countries and in many developed countries, the potentials for new hydro are quite limited. But this is clearly, uh, if, if the potential is here, this is clearly, clearly the best solution to, to balance and to back up uh, variable renewables. Biomass is an option, but biomass... Uh, there are other uses of biomass and there, are, there is competition for the different uses of limited potential of biomass, but it can be used also, that's clear. Storage will be, of course, very important for electricity, whether on batteries or even uh, storing uh, renewable electricity in the form of hydrogen. Uh, but this, these are the, the frontiers, I would say, of the transition today. Countries like Germany currently are indeed uh, uh, exploring the potentials of these uh, different options. But to some extent, in those countries uh, that uh, are 
emerging now have a, a strong growth in electricity demand, I would consider that natural gas is not a miracle solution, of course, but I would say this is a transitional solution in the transition. It can help in the very short term to meet uh, rising electricity uh, needs uh, with a relatively uh, relatively uh, less carbon intensive options and and indeed we have in the in the in the long term horizon this hypothesis of having a low carbon and uh, uh, natural and gas from uh, bio bio sources uh, i think this is all the questions that have been uh, raised and so we can we can probably come to the conclusion of this webinar. Again, I hope that uh, uh, it has provided you the, the taste and the spirit of what we are trying to develop with uh, Enertram. Uh, I, I would conclude by saying that uh, I've been working many years on uh, on uh, modeling of uh, energy systems, and uh, this indeed provided part of the, of the tools such as the Pulse model and more recently uh, it seems to me it seemed to me that the focus on what are the, the really important things and important issue to be to be examined uh, in depth in depth examined is this question of uh, observing the implementation of uh, energy transition policies because this is already some years ago that these policies has, has started observing what works what uh, works less uh, less uh, efficiently and so have developed this concept of uh, having flexible policies policies that learn in the process this seems to me a very important concept and we hope that enertram uh, may contribute to a better understanding and a better definition of this uh, dynamic uh, policy framework for energy transitions. Thank you very much for your attention and goodbye.